If you want to understand America today, look at Wisconsin. Now, when I say Wisconsin, you might be thinking of a place with lots of cheese, or hats made to look like cheese, or maybe even the world champions, the Milwaukee Bucks. But Wisconsin is about a lot more than that. Wisconsin is a symbol of what's happened to the United States over the last 50 years. It's a canary in the coal mine of American life. Whether it's an assault on the rights of workers, preventing the majority of voters from having their say, or assaulting the right to vote itself, Wisconsin has been a proving ground for how our country is failing. But it wasn't always this way. In fact, it used to be, well, almost the reverse. So let's go back about 100 years. The German and Scandinavian immigrants who came to Wisconsin in the 19th century brought with them communitarian ideas. They had an emphasis on collective solidarity over individual success. Wisconsinites displayed a remarkably durable social fabric built on strong communal ties, vigorous labor unions, and a deeply democratic and egalitarian worldview. Early on, they wanted to abolish slavery and embrace Lincoln's Republican Party. Later, they embraced populist anti-monopolist movements like the Progressive Party of Robert La Follette. And in the 20th century, in cities like Milwaukee, they elected socialist mayors and socialist members of Congress. They saw Wisconsin as a laboratory of democracy, a place where ideas like the progressive income tax or unemployment insurance were tried for the first time before being implemented on the national scale. It was a concept they called the Wisconsin idea, that government was supposed to be a tool to better the lives of ordinary people. There was a broad social democratic consensus backed by a powerful labor movement about what government can and should provide for ordinary people. That's what defined Wisconsin for decades. But in the second half of the 20th century, all of that came under assault. Starting in the 1970s and accelerating in the 80s and 90s, waves of deindustrialization swept across the Midwest, and they hit Wisconsin particularly hard. The industrial base that supported so much of social and political life decayed rapidly. As companies outsourced or automated their workforces, factories were shuttered, workers were laid off, and towns fell apart. It was a disaster for places like Milwaukee or Kenosha, where deindustrialization led to a crisis of joblessness and despair that lingers on today. In today's Wisconsin, one in every seven children live in poverty, and that includes one of every two black children. And in the 1980s, a similar crisis began in Wisconsin's rural areas. As interest rates climbed, family farmers found themselves unable to pay back their debts, leading to a massive campaign of farm repossessions, where hundreds of thousands of people lost everything. The farm crisis led not only to hundreds of suicides by farmers, but to a transformation of agriculture itself. Family farmers were pushed out, and huge new agribusiness giants like ConAgra or Cargill took over much of Wisconsin's farmland. After these two successive crises, Wisconsin, like much of the United States, found itself in a quiet but deep social malaise by the beginning of the 21st century. Median incomes were stagnant, incarceration was rising, Factories were closing, rural towns were depopulating, atomization and suicide were rising. The only people doing very well were members of a new class of ultra-rich elites, the same people who ran those companies like Cargill or ConAgra. But political leaders in both parties didn't care. To them, Wisconsin was still a testing ground for new ideas, but those ideas had changed. To them, government was no longer a tool that could help people, but instead an enemy to be slashed, limited, and made it ineffective. Republicans focused mainly on catering to the new elites, while Democrats gradually abandoned their relationship with labor unions and focused on educated professionals. Under Republican Governor Tommy Thompson in the 80s and 90s, Wisconsin pioneered welfare reform programs that reduced benefits and cut eligibility just as people needed them most. And under Democratic Governor Jim Doyle in the 2000s, the state eagerly cut budgets and laid off government workers. None of this, of course, improved material conditions. Plants were continuing to close or downsize. Cities and rural areas continued to decay. And in 2010, amidst a wave of discontent, 
Republicans won the state legislature and the governor's office, winning about a third of union households. The new governor was a conservative named Scott Walker. Walker was very different from early generations who had defined Wisconsin. He liked to play up his blue-collar credentials and occasionally drove a Harley-Davidson motorcycle. But beneath the facade, the new governor was an agent of the wealthy elites, and he saw his time as governor as an opportunity to put their worldviews into practice. The main enemy, Walker thought, was Wisconsin's labor unions. Though they were much weaker than they had once been, they were still the biggest remnant of the social democratic coalition that was so central to Wisconsin politics. So the governor adopted a strategy of divide and conquer. First, he sought to isolate the state's public sector unions, branding them as greedy and wasteful of taxpayer funds. He enacted a law outlawing collective bargaining for workplace safety, capping wage increases, and requiring recertification elections for the union every year. Within a few years, Wisconsin's public sector unions lost about 70% of their membership. And once he had hamstrung the public sector unions, he focused on private sector unions, signing a right-to-work bill that aimed to dramatically reduce union membership. Within a few years, Walker had cut Wisconsin's unionization rate nearly in half to roughly the same size as Alabama, a state with a long and violent anti-union history. In just five years, Walker had successfully hobbled the state's long tradition of labor power. Now, at the same time, the governor led a dramatic remaking of democracy in Wisconsin. Shortly after taking office, he approved a new electoral map of the state that divided districts to ensure large majorities for Republicans in every legislative election. Democratic voters were divided into a few districts where they would win overwhelmingly, and then a larger number of districts where they'd always lose. It was one of the most effective gerrymanders in American political history. In 2018, for instance, Democrats won a majority of the statewide vote for state assembly, 53%, compared to 45% for Republicans. But Republicans still won about two-thirds of the state assembly seats. In order to have gained even a small majority in 2018, Democrats would have needed to win by about 20 points statewide, 65% of the vote, an almost impossible feat. With an essentially permanent majority, Republicans are empowered in Wisconsin's government basically no matter what happens in any election. And when a Democratic governor won office in 2018, the Republican legislature executed an 11th hour power grab that stripped him of many of his powers and strengthened their own. Because Wisconsin doesn't have a system of direct democracy, there's practically nothing that can be done about any of this. Wisconsin today is a very different place than the Wisconsin of 100 years ago. The egalitarian worldview of Wisconsin progressives and socialists is gone. The institutions that allowed that world to flourish, the factories and labor unions, the thriving towns and cities, the basic sense of community and solidarity have disintegrated. And the democracy that was once at the heart of the Wisconsin idea has become a farce, where every election returns the same party to power. What this means for Wisconsinites is that policies that are popular with the vast majority of Wisconsin voters, like legalizing recreational marijuana, raising the minimum wage, and expanding Medicaid, have no shot of becoming law. In other words, Wisconsinites don't really live in a representative democracy. But this isn't just a story about Wisconsin. It's also part of a global story. The same story that's played out all across the West, in the north of France, in the east of Germany, or in northern England. It's a story of loss. Not just the loss of jobs and the dissolution of communities, but of the loss of possibility, of hope. The loss of the bright futures once offered by the mass politics of working people. All we're left with is a dreary present. And there's no better symbol of that than Wisconsin, a state that, though always imperfect, once represented equality, solidarity, and democracy has become a symbol of a new type of society. We traded away those time-tested ideals and in turn got a society that was far more oligarchic, more atomized, and more adrift than the one that had come before. And in that bargain, we're all worse off. I'm Philip Rocco, Associate Professor of Political Science at Marquette University for the Gravel Institute.